All right, Ben, if you only had one minute to give music artists the best music marketing advice you possibly could, what would you say? One minute on the clock. One of the reasons Spotify get talks about so much, I think, is just they put play counts and follower counts right there on the on the screen for you to see. And that means that um, it's very easy to kind of like rank yourself and evaluate yourself as an artist, but also for consumers and business uh, types to do the same. You have these opportunities to market it. The fact that other music is released is not a detriment to your music. The Spotify today of having a single pitch song for an artist at a time does a lot of other creative you know, decisions for like that impacts way down the, the deal stream of the artist. Let's go. All right. Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> One minute. I think you don't need a full minute to say this, but just because you as the artist have already heard the song a million times and lived with it doesn't mean your fans have. And you don't have to rush it out to services and to the world. Take a minute to think about how you want the song to be heard for the first time, how you want your fans to discover it. If you're a new artist, you discover, you're, you're finding fans with that song for the first time. And if you're an established artist, they've already got a preconception of you as an artist and your work. So you don't need to bang them over the head with the new song just when you've delivered it. You can take some time to plan out the release of that work with your distribu distribution partner, with your management team, whoever else is involved in the project. Don't just drop it right away because you finished with it and are happy with it. Bam. Perfect. Exactly a minute. <laughs> so um, I, I blathered for 20 seconds at the beginning there was saying nothing, but yeah. <laughs> it happens to everyone. So uh one thing that a lot of a lot of people say online is to essentially release as much music as humanly possible, just kind of tailoring to what you just said. But also, when you release songs, it's permanent, like it's out there forever. And I heard a quote that says, uh, delayed is only temporary, but suck is forever. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what's your perspective on like how much music artists should be releasing uh, just to maximize their efforts? Like, is there is there a too fast? Is there a too slow? Yeah. Anything in there? That's a great question. We have that, and we have artists and that we work with at downtown artist level services that fit the whole variety of that spectrum. Where it's like, wow, that we haven't had a new song from Artist X in forever, or wow, three songs from Artist Y this week alone. Exciting! Like, great, their fans will be pumped. Um, three songs two week a week is probably too much, unless it's part of an album project, right? Um, yeah. One song a year is probably too little unless you're, you know, at a very certain point in your career where it's not, you know, music, releasing new music is no longer the, the point of it. Um, but, but ultimately, I think consumers, fans of anything have a threshold of interest in any one subject and is even the super fans have a certain capacity in which they can consume. And then there's also the expectations of the artist, right? Like what level of audience do you want your song to reach? And if the goal of releasing a lot of songs is because you want to have a lot of songs out, then there's no reason you shouldn't just release a lot of songs. But if your goal of releasing a lot of songs is to have them heard by the most amount of people and make the most amount of impact with those people, then I think you need to think about the pacing of how those songs come out. And you probably, you know, there's there's different points in your career, you're gonna have a different, your fans are gonna have a different appetite for that. And when you're younger yeah. and fewer songs in general, they're gonna have a bigger hunger for more songs. When you've kind of got a few of those seminal records in your pocket that people are really aware of and are the touch points for you as an artist, then I think you can space it out a little bit more and be more thoughtful about how you want to continue to evolve the career and, and your fan base and what you want them to hear. And there's probably also places for different types of songs, right? Like a Spotify, an Apple, a YouTube video, those releases are all official and permanent and they're never going to disappear. Yeah. You know, if you test something as a live stream on a Twitch mm -hmm. or in a TikTok snippet or uh, on Instagram, you have a lot more leeway to kind of like 
you know, share things with an audience yeah. that are, you know, in a more rapid response mechanism than you would if you're, again, putting it on your Spotify page forever. So it really depends right. on the medium. It depends on your state of your career. Uh, if I was going to give an average, just like, hey, what should I do? You know, a song a month is probably a great amount. You're, you're looking at 12 songs a year. That's an album, an album a year, good cadence. If you you could speed it up a little bit more or slow it down a little bit more, but that's kind of like a nice sweet spot that is not going to, if you're at a, you know, relatively, you're earning an earning point in your career for music that you're going to not, upset the apple cart from a dsp or a fan right. or a team basis yeah it, interesting you brought up how it changes over the course of a career based on where the person's at because i'll talk to people and they'll say something like oh well taylor swift just dropped an album with no singles so therefore just dropping a whole album and not releasing anything for two years is fine right because taylor swift did it it's like well taylor swift could release an album on cassette only that requires a proprietary music player and she would make $10 million, <laughs> you know? So, um, and like Kanye West even did that crazy thing years ago with the little pod music player and he probably made yeah. a killing, but, and then the artist can't really do that. <laughs> no, it's very hard. I think um, none of us except Taylor Swift or Taylor Swift. And so yeah. you don't want to find yourself I certainly, on the distribution side and the artist support side, it's a hard argument to call a partner like a Spotify and YouTube and say, well, our artist X would like to do this because Taylor Swift did it. And then the DSP has to, you know, kind of gently explain, well, you know, artist X isn't exactly Taylor Swift, you know, right now. And so, yeah. you know, I think um, we all are have humbleness presented to us in different formats in life and I, it's easy to be humbled by taylor and, uh, <laughs> so we should you know uh, market accordingly when it comes to singles versus albums um uh, the kind of common knowledge getting thrown around the interwebs nowadays is you have a 10 song album yep. you're probably going to release five six or seven of those songs as singles whereas few decades ago and even major artists today might drop one or two singles and then drop the record so now it's it's like even some big artists will have they'll have 20 singles that they've released and they haven't even bundled them to an album um wh what do you think about that whole singles versus album album debate and when does it make yeah. sense for to drop a record i don't i want to go back and say like i don't actually think the consumption pattern has radically changed for fans but, you know, in the world where there was like two singles and then an album, because I think if you look back, if you probably even look at the Spotify charts of the songs that were singles on albums released in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then the albums, you would see that the singles are the ones that are most listened to on those on those albums, like in general, even today, even in the modern Spotify streaming era of just the last, you know, eight years of data. And that's because those songs were marketed more. They had more uh, visibility in, in the consumer landscape via radio, via whatever, you know, touring, you know, other <clears throat> excuse me, synchronization opportunities. That was how people consumed the music. And they people were buying albums to listen to those singles in an on-demand format, which they could not get in a pre-internet era. So now people have just kind of, taking the logical step of that on the release strategy side, which is to say, okay, we're going to just release them as singles so that people hear them, get the promotional drivers that are attuned with that in the contemporary landscape and the digital services that are offered today. And uh, then we'll release the, the body of work as an album, you know, together once we feel like we've kind of exhausted the songs that we feel like we can you know, create a video for, or create a new release radar campaign for, or some other like TikTok meme campaign for. And <laughs> I, I think, you know, or, or like that we feel it was like strong enough to stand alone as, as singles. And so I think that we've really kind of like just reached the more like logical commercial endpoint of giving consumers music in the format they want to listen to it in. Yeah. And that the album, right, was like kind of like a like, almost like 
the Beatles, right, were the ones who kind of were credited with like putting together the cohesive idea of an album, and then it kind of became a industry standard. And and now we're in a world where it's like getting deconstructed again into like <laughs> I want to put out a bunch of singles, and then when I feel like I've got enough, I'm gonna anthologize them into an album or something. And so, yeah. um, which is then great again for souveniring, like as vinyl or something else for for, for super fans. Um, but there are also artists who want to put out a project because they think it cohesively does work as a whole. Yeah. And we have a lot of um, artists in the Musica Mexicana space where they're kind of like jump between like sounds, like they'll do different styles of Musica Mexicana and they might have a, multiple singles that fit different styles, but then they'll have like an album that has like one of or two of those singles with a bunch of other songs that are in the more, in, in like a common you know, genre or range of the genre um, or subgenre there. So, I, you know, I, I've seen that kind of happen too, where it's just like, it's not that they're releasing as many, they're not even releasing as many singles as you just described out of the course of an album, but they're still releasing a lot of music. It's then just yeah. intermixed with some albums that are more cohesive in terms of like what the viewpoint mm. is or the styles is. What do you feel like, uh, platforms like Spotify have kind of influenced that release cadence where, you know, you can only have one song from a release go on release radar and you can only pitch one song from a release to Spotify editorial. Um, I think that's where some of the aggressive single game has come from. Cause it's like, well, I have 10 songs. I don't want to only be able to pitch one editorial. Ideally I'd like to pitch all 10, but the only way to do that is to release every single song as a single <laughs> I think, I think, I mean, you just, you answered the question a lot for me, right? I think there's, there are always, um, like limits, limitations of the formats of the era or the time that are going to drive marketing and creative, impact creative decisions as well. Um, in a very distant past life, I was, uh, running, I ran, I did digital at a music management company and um one of the clients <clears throat> this is uh you know at the time they were they were quite the big band was limp biscuit and for yeah them, i used to love those guys <laughs> for, for chocolate starfish and the hot dog flavored water there was the very controversial decision to go with two radio singles like my way and roland at the same time and i was 22 at the time i don't know and uh I didn't realize like what that meant from like a radio marketing expense and like what they were really convincing the label to go for in terms of a marketing spend and effort and you mm -hmm. know how that rolled out. And, um, but it was, it was meaningful and costly to do that kind of a strategy. And I think it worked in that case and that was the right time for that band, but it's, um, you know, the Spotify today of having a single, pitch song for an artist at a time does a lot of other creative, you know, decisions for like that impacts way down the, the deal stream of the artist, right? Like, yeah. Hey, if you're a major label artist and you have that in your, you have that restriction, you know, that Spotify has that restriction. Is your label going to let you do a co-primary collab with an artist that you are really passionate about working with within a certain window of your record coming out? Mm. Probably not because it's going to impact their ability to recover their investment with you on the project that you're, you know, you're fronting directly or something because now you're a co-primary and you're going to get knocked off the, um, right. the pitch radar for your project or something potentially. And so there's a, there's challenges that, that are opened up by that. I think that's a, a huge factor you pointed out. Um, I will say that my understanding is that Spotify did make a recent change to release radar that will benefit collaborations extensively, mm -hmm. which is it used to be release radar was only tied to the album or the release level oh. primary artist. <laughs> and within the last couple of weeks, they've changed it to the track level. So now if you have a co-primary on a track on your album who would therefore not be a album co-primary but a track co-primary yeah. that track would then be eligible for that co-primaries fan bases release radar which yeah. is a great for for these you know you know hip-hop music mexicana tons of yeah. collaborative genres where you're able to then 
make sure that a bigger audience sees something and you don't have to force release it as a single, you know, you know, it's going to get there. Yeah. In, in the album. It's funny how, um, how much of a subtle change that is, but how much of a big impact that can make. Like basically what you're saying is you drop a 10 song record. It's by you, but song number eight is you and so-and-so you're pitching song number eight because like, that's the focus one. So it goes to not only your release radar now, which which it would a month ago. Now it's mm. also going to the so and so other artists release radars for their followers and all that jazz. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's that's actually a, a subtle big thing. I'm surprised Spotify doesn't market some of their or even decisions even if they're <laughs> not pitching that track. The other artists could pitch that track. Oh. Because they're on that track now, co primary. I think. Yeah. I yeah. Figure sort sort out. But yeah. yeah. That's actually a nice change. Now, on the note about editorials, when I like a couple of years ago, when I was newer to everything, I didn't know. Uh, the, Spotify made it sound like the only way to get an editorial playlist is to go on that pitching tool and to fill out this thing, and then they're going to check it out, and if they like it, they're going to add it. And then over time, as I worked with more more labels and more, uh, I don't know to call them high end distributors. Um, that they'd be able to go on the back end, like on your behalf and pitch. And then I've even had some where they're like, oh yeah, we have regular calls with Spotify. We're able to like elevate songs to the, to, to get their attention. Um, and a lot of artists don't realize that, that there is like, it's not only the pitching tool, like that services that like kind of a, you know, fancy distributor <laughs> or a label um, can actually, actually influence the edit stuff so can you talk a little bit about how that yeah. aspect works i'm guessing a downtown music artist and label services from from the outside looking at it, it looks like you're for lack of a better term a fancy distributor but also you have other stuff like you downtown music I'm looking around for a fancy hat to put on but yeah I, we <laughs> all um and we and we already like started that way like that was the founding mission was to like work with career artists yeah who are making a living from their music and to then go and fill those gaps in where um, like the non-creative, like quote unquote non-creative gaps, like how, yeah. how to help them with the digital retail sales presence, how to help them with the digital marketing and visibility for the album. So yes, that's where we fit in. We want to help tell that narrative story of the music release a lot stronger for the artist than they might it, not to say that an artist can't tell the story well in themselves, but they might have the, the same amount of time and, and energy to do yeah. that part of the work. And we believe that we can do a very effective job of communicating the retail narrative for the artists and creating a bigger um, footprint for them on streaming services than they would get on a straight DIY sit setting. That yeah. said, Spotify is very clear to be eligible for editorial playlisting. Uh, somebody's got to put it through the Spotify for artist pitch process, right? And a lot of times it's somebody on our staff um, on behalf of the artists. And I can tell you from personal experience in the last month alone, visiting Spotify with some of those staff members, we've got a great reputation. Um, they said like, oh, it's so great to meet you, Cliff. Like, I love reading your pitches. They're fantastic. Like there's little, <laughs> little fans at the DSPs of our um our team in terms of their ability to like write pitches that are appropriate for the editors that they has the information that they need to be at, you know, take action and properly program the music, yeah. which I think is important for them to help them do their jobs better uh, and more efficiently. Um, and then, as you said, by virtue of us being in a room with the DSPs, you know, there are opportunities um, to directly reach out and give, um, the label teams and the editorial teams additional information about the records that might be meaningful in the programming um editorial programming that they do yeah. uh, they're still making their own decisions uh but you know they're they're gonna if you've got an artist that's a top 500 global um you know streamer on spotify they're probably going to be willing to sit down and listen to the album in advance and some key tracks from there and sort of talk about what a release plan might look like and how that slots into other priorities that the spot Spotify or the other DSPs may have at the time. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, you're going to get that from a fancy distributor or from a label and that's 
part and core part of our job and our responsibility is to try and like level up that access, not just on the advance of release, but also six months after a year after like whenever the, the songs are like, no matter how long they've been out while they're in our stewardship, how do we continue to tell that story at the right time to the right places to increase the audience base and listenership and the other opportunities. So there's always yeah. seasonality, right? Like, I mean, we have a lot of music that happens to be great for Halloween playlists, right? So we have a spike <laughs> on Halloween and we do a lot of editorial programming and our own programming around Halloween playlists for things like lo-fi, lo-fi Halloween and things like that. And <laughs> that's great for, you know, everybody, right? It's like, it's a seasonal lift. And there's things yeah. that just like, you know, there's a TikTok made that I hit it off for a song that's several, uh, release cycles old, but you want to then go back and highlight and make sure that the, that information's on the radar of the programmers at Spotify, at Apple, at YouTube, and say like, Hey, this thing is happening over here on a place that, you know, a lot of your fans come from, you might as well integrate it into the playlist that you know that they're listening to uh, on your platform. Mm -hmm. And, and that works very well as well. You mentioned specifically several times about telling the song story. Like what is, what is like the, not just the story of the, like the meaning of the song or anything, but what is the story, the narrative of like the promotional effort of the song? Yeah. Like how is it be, how is it being pushed and what does it mean? How does it tie into other stuff? What do you think the most important aspect of that equation is to, to, um, for example, a Spotify editorial or, or other DSP editorial coverage like right. is it the is it the the song is it the, the promotion is it how it ties in is it everything is equal okay i think just like we were talking earlier about different phases at different phases of the song's lifestyle there's different things that are important to spotify uh before the song comes out it is going to be the two most important things are going to be what the song sounds like right does it are they, is everybody excited about the song is it, is it a compelling song or people jazzed about it and um and then equal probably equal to that what is spotify's perception of the attention that that song is going to get upon release right do they feel that the artist is going to drive a lot of engagement specifically obviously in their case to spotify in another dsp's case to to dspx will listeners come to listen to that song when the song comes out do they feel like that's going to happen so those two things kind of come in as soon as the song comes out, you know, you know, you already know what number one is basically, right? You kind of got an idea of what you think the song sounds like. And then you start to get a sense from like actual listener data of like, is it being listened to all the way through? Is it being saved? Is it creating new follows on the uh, account for the artist? On the, you know, is there, is there a listenership growing? Is it being shared? Um, those, those other hard data factors start to become real material in like how it's yeah. how it's going right so just like in the dark ages the olden days like radio would wait on like you'd have like you press the song and he's like well the phone's ringing do people pick it up and like what was the name of that song and they asked for it again now you've got the real people playing it again and again and that data becomes very important right all of a sudden the actual yeah. listenership data becomes very important for the, the future of the song um and then sometimes it can take another another external factor right like a, you know that that you know was it two years ago the run, uh, running down the mountain kate oh saw, running up that running up, running the hill, up, running up that hill yeah <laughs> the hill right like it was a popular song it was great everybody liked it as a hit but like all of a sudden it's a hit again because it got used in a compelling way in stranger things and yeah. now it made sense to re program it editorially to put it back in places that people would come across it, even though they didn't need to get, it didn't need to get put there. It was available on the service. People yeah. could just, they knew it, but like now it fits for that playlist. Now people are excited to hear it. And, you know, it was, it was a value add for everybody. And then somebody, yeah. you know, does the good work of telling that part of the story of the song. Right. So pivoting to marketing for a little bit, um, Downtown Music as a whole, uh, people listening to this might have never heard of Downtown Music. I didn't know about it until, I don't know, maybe six months ago. I was looking up, I forget, Song Trust or something, because I, I did a sponsored video for Song Trust back then. And um, 
I noticed that downtown music owns a little bit of like every aspect of the music industry, which is kind of crazy. Like CD Baby, Soundrop, SongTrust, Fuga, and then you have arts and label services and you have publishing, you have neighboring rights and uh, some platform called Curve for like label analytics. And so you guys see everything. Obviously you're in the artist and label services, but um, you probably see a ton of music that succeeds and fails <laughs> on both sides. Um, can you talk a little bit about what are the best marketing methods that you see artists using most effectively, either free methods or paid mm -hmm. methods, or what's the most common? What's the, you know, any kind of uh, intuition on what's working and what's not? Um, for every season, you know, there is a, there's a new format. And I would say like for the last, oh, that's going on three years now. It, it's short form video is the primary sort of marketing yeah. m methodology. Um, it, it makes the obvious sense why it's the most used, right? It's, uh, it's ubiquitous, right? Every major, I mean, TikTok's its own platform, but now Meta and YouTube have their own flavors of it, right? It's, it's integrated into some form of social media that most people use. Um, I was at a Meta event a couple weeks last week and I, or two weeks ago, and they were sharing some data that like something like every day, two billion reels are shared alone, like a billion of them by my wife to me. So like, there's another billion happening out there. Um, so it's like, it's ubiquitous. Everyone's using it. But also I think really critically, it's like you're, you have audio on probably 95% of the time you're consuming that. And so there's a, a song familiarity thing. And there's some data point that I'm now probably just convinced myself is true and made up in the past. But I, I thought I heard at one point, which was that it took like 40 times of hearing a song before you gain familiarity with it. Back, This is an old radio data point I heard where it's like, basically, yeah. you got to spin the song on the radio station a bunch of times. And the consumers got to hear it 40 times before they're like, oh, I, yeah, I know that song. And I think um, that's what short form video provides now for artists. If you can get the song in a place that people are just bumping into it again and again and again, they're going to breed familiarity with it and then they're going to seek it out and say, assuming they like it, they're going to seek it out and, and yeah. listen to it on, on demand, save it to a playlist and have a, have a more of a true commercial relationship with it. So um, yeah, short answer is short form video has become the, everybody can't can't miss it and, and that's where we've certainly been investing our uh not only our time but just our hiring and our staffing and our time uh, is around like who who are experts in that space and who can we bring in to help our clients uh get stronger there right how is there any and you might not know this because again you, you don't have your hands in every aspect of of the company that you're in and that because you're, you're the president of ours and label services so Obviously, there's employees under you that each have their own responsibilities and laser focus on it. But are there any certain uh, rules of thumb or tactics that you're you're telling like a lot of the the your main artists that they work most with? Like you gotta you gotta post at this frequency or there's like look at these particular styles of video, um, etc. Yeah, it's um, that one's a challenge, and I've had this one for a long time back, even when I was like really like arms deep or elbows deep in the uh the helping artists do this kind of thing like back in the you know like how often are they doing my my, my myspace page yeah. kind of era <laughs> and uh do i need to change out the top eight every day like is it how's it go um it's it's tricky because some people just you know like the algorithm is what the algorithm is and it's designed to just drive uh time on the apps, basically, like they, how much time are users spending on the apps. And if your content makes them spend more time on the apps, your content will get shown more. So uh, if you can figure that out, great. You'll get people that is what they watch you, but the algorithm will, will help you out. Um, and if you don't post very frequently, the algorithm will slow your post down because they just assume that you're not there to help them keep people on the app, basically. Um, yeah. But that said, that just because TikTok is going to punish your page promotes because you don't post once a day or twice a week or three times a week. doesn't mean you, everyone has to post three times a week or can post three times a week. So if you're just yeah. not 
emotionally or mentally or <laughs> creatively mm-hmm. capable of doing that, it's, um, you know, you don't do it, right? There's, there's, yeah. What are you going to do? Like, you're just, you're, everyone's going to run out of gas at, at some point. And I think we've probably all followed cool. somebody on one of the social media sites that we were like, had a, felt like we had a deep relationship with because you'd see their clips all the time and then all of a sudden just kind of disappeared from your feed and then like six months later it might pop up again you're like why did that just oh okay yeah i remember that but yeah. so that that's gonna happen to people um and i think uh you want to if you're the artist post what you can and and you know obviously you're going to get re- the algorithm will reward more frequent posting but you do what you can our job at artists and label services and and other fancy distributors and labels is going to be how do we help you fill in the gaps there? How do we help you streamline that in a way that makes it manageable? How do we engage with partners and third parties to integrate the music in a way that you don't also have to post it? Now, granted, it's improved if the artist is posting and then engaging with people who use their music in their posts and doing other things because it all kind of feeds together in the way that accounts are connected to sounds or account or yeah. connected to creates etc but um you can you can do a little bit of additional coverage by working with you know either third-party agencies or labels or folks that are kind of like helping you manage those uh those marketing campaigns to, to create other visibility opportunities. Right, right. A lot of people online talk about specifically TikTok and Spotify, which Spotify, biggest market share, TikTok, fastest rising market share. Um, but in terms of users, comp like a little bit less than Instagram, a lot less than YouTube, for example. Why does it seem like the music industry is so obsessed with TikTok? Like, obviously, it's it's an audio first platform; it's vertical video. But it's like every every time I'm on like Music Business Worldwide or whatever like music industry site, it's like TikTok did this thing, TikTok did this thing, and it seems like especially major labels are always talking about TikTok, and they're like poaching artists who are on the rise on TikTok specifically. I'm sure it happens on Instagram. It just feels like all the eyes are on like TikTok, and then now they have TikTok Music all that so yeah what's your perspective uh, on that i i think it's uh it's 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 numbers and success right like one of the reasons spotify get talks about so much i think is just they put play counts and follower counts right there on the on the screen for you to see and that means that um it's very easy to kind of like rank yourself and evaluate yourself as an artist, but also for consumers and business uh, types to do the same. And there, that, that, that number being out there just makes it easier to talk about success on Spotify versus success on Apple, even though there's artists that are much higher streamers on Apple and make, you know, more, plenty more there than they do on Spotify. They just don't, there's no numbers like visible to the consumer to kind of indicate that. Um, YouTube's got, and then, then YouTube's obviously talked about too, because the same thing is the number right there. How many views mm. does this video have? Wow, it's massive. Okay. Um, TikTok, I, I think the, I'm going to show my naivety here, here a little bit about the specifics of it, but you do see the, some of the data around creates a little bit more visibly, I think, on TikTok than you do on shorts and reels in terms of like how many times the sound's been used or like what's trending. Mm-hmm. But I think really what it comes down to is that until pretty recently, the TikTok algorithm was superior to the other other ones in terms of delivering exactly what a consumer wanted. So people felt like TikTok was just for them when they opened it up. Well, it's like, oh, this is yeah. exactly what I'm interested in. And it's special to me. And I think reels and shorts have probably gotten there at this point, but um, that you know, it takes time for the conversation to change a little bit. Yeah. So people just still say TikTok instead of saying short form video or shorts or whatever you want, you know, whatever. And I don't know what the Kleenex yeah. term for it is. Maybe TikTok is the Kleenex term. For <laughs> it's kind of becoming yeah. that. Go make a TikTok form video. video. Yeah. Is it's the yeah it's 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 all short form video, but they call them TikToks. And 
I think, so I think there's that factor. And I just think the other thing is there's not a, um, while there are TikTok artists, right, that have broken up out of TikTok, Meta and YouTube don't yet have their examples of that artist in the same way where yeah. it's like, oh, the content was created on this platform here, consumed on this platform here, and has exploded. And I think um, that's, that is an internal marketing challenge for them to bolster because mm-hmm. they probably do have those case studies. There probably are those yeah. artists and creators that are, have done so. Uh, and it's like, how do you get that story out and how do you like make it? And cause, cause it'll benefit them, right? It benefits Meta, right. it benefits YouTube to, to have that happen. And then, and to tell that story so that more people use their platform and they become the catchphrase for the, yeah. the terminology instead of TikTok. Right. Right. Um, a lot of small indie artists think that the industry is stacked against them, which, you know, in, in certain ways, maybe it is, <laughs> but in a, in a, in a way it's never been better time to be an indie artist, like in history. Cause like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the, the marketing methods you could do were all either super high dollar amounts or unreachable without a, a really crazy connection. Um, but then also the market's so saturated on the flip side, like there's a hundred thousand songs being released a day. So how can artists succeed in a world where a hundred thousand songs are, are released in a day? Like how do they stand out from the norm? And especially where everyone's posting like two videos on TikTok a day and everyone's releasing two songs a month. Um, what are things that artists can do to stand out from the, the sea of noise that's being pumped out? Yeah, I think that's, um, Certainly, a call, it gets a question that gets asked and raised a lot. But I, I agree with what you were starting this off with, which is it's a great time for indie artists. It's a phenomenal time. The like the whole gamut of the music industry has become affordable for access to people, which is just insane. Yeah. Like you can make your entire record on your phone, you know, right? Like you have like a studio mixing board probably in this thing that is equivalent to what you know, you too used in the eighties and nineties to make their record, like in terms of like what you can yeah. do to record and engineer and, and create. Right. So that's amazing. That's available to just about everybody now. Um, and then you don't have to pray that somebody hears you in a bar or a club and decides to sign you or, you know, listens to a demo tape you that you made poorly in order to syndicate it out to, you know, manufacture enough pieces of plastic that people could then listen to it across the country or even a region. So um, it, it, it's like, you just, I think it's kind of like different. It's like you, there's probably a ton of music being made uh, 40, 50 years ago. It just yeah. almost none of it was recorded and released and now everybody's recording and releasing everything which is just kind of like the nature of society now and everything's you know how many ring doorbell cameras do you see every day on tiktok too <laughs> um yeah. so i it's like you i so i don't i don't i don't think the answer is has to be too much more complicated than just continue to make great music which is a little arbitrary i get it but i think the other fun thing about a hundred thousand songs being released every day is like, no, nope, nobody's forcing you. Nobody, no, everybody knows they're not, nobody's listening to a hundred thousand new songs every day. And that people have a certain amount of time that they're devoting to listening to music and discovering music and either. Yes, this is my music time, or it's just, it's in the background of other things I'm doing and I'm, there's new music. Yeah. Um, so like, I don't, I think you just, you, you're going to release it. You have these opportunities to market it. The fact that other music is released is not a detriment to your music. It's just, there's other music yeah. out there. It's fine. You do, you're going to do what you're going to do for your music. And there's like, I don't think you want to think about just how many, like, you know, it's like you, if you're trying to be in the NFL, right? Like there's only a few <laughs> NFL players, but like, well, you're not thinking about that when you're playing pop Warner football, or you're not thinking about the major leagues when you're playing little league. It's like, you're yeah. playing now and you're having fun and you're doing what you need to do. And, as the years progress and the game progresses, you know, other yeah. options become available or not. It's also, it's nice when you think about how many people there are. Like there's 8 billion people on earth. 
And even if you only have 0.01% of them that love your music, that's a thriving music career, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like 1% of the world listening to your music would be um, 80 million fans, right? Something yeah, like that. Absolutely. I think that math is correct. Um, yep. And then even 1% of that is 8 million. And then down 800, to 800,000 fans. So 1% of 1% gives you a thriving music career. And so yeah. even if there's 100,000 songs a day, it's like how many are in your genre and how many are um, good, right? Probably half of them are awful. <laughs> just guessing. Yeah, so, yeah. And well, what's great today is that there's, you know, like you get to go as a fan, you get to find music that you're really interested in. You're not tied to what the seven music formats on FM radio were for you in your town, in your immediate region and what they're – very tightly curated playlist of like 45 songs for the yeah. month are you've got you and you don't have to and to for sample other stuff you don't have to go like you know beg for a listening station to open up or hope that your local library has it you can just literally sample it and then keep moving you know which yeah people get frustrated by like oh my a sample of my song should be worth more than it is but i i don't know i think uh I think people are, are, I think artists and fans have benefited from the ubiquitous access to music. And I think it's, yeah. I think the price of a music subscription remains the single greatest like exchange of value for entertainment that's out there today in terms of like, oh, I can listen to every song ever recorded for 12 bucks a month. Yeah. Not, not a bad, it's, it, you know, versus from like, a music fan, it's, it's a, the best time ever. Because yeah. it's so cheap to listen to the world's library of music, and it, honestly, to me, it feels too cheap. Like people are willing to pay seventy bucks a month for Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, uh, Paramount Plus, whatever. I mean, I pay for all of those, every single one of them, because I like this show and this one and this show and this one. Um, but there's a lot of people who don't watch a certain show because they can't justify it for like paying for another subscription. So it is nice to be able to just tell someone like, "This is my new song." You don't have to pay anything for it. You already paid for it last month, so you have it. On the flip side, though, it, it makes me wonder, like, why do fans value – they're willing to pay 70 bucks a month for all these video subscriptions, but you tell them you're going to raise the price of Spotify from 9 to 9 to 10.99, and they're like, what the – they're flipping tables. And, um, you know, it's – it's like it seems fans – it's the best time to be a fan because of that, but also it seems like fans don't – know how good they have it from a price perspective <laughs> yeah I, I mean you know music it's, it's audio in general has just it's been free for a hundred years in the u.s yeah. from radio right like you oh listen to the radio it's free and like even i don't i don't know what struggles but i presume there were some to cable television kind of like being like hey well we got broadcast to you and well what if you paid 50 bucks a month and then you could also have tv and be like well, but i already have an antenna for tv right so yeah. i think they but they did that a lot earlier than music did right there was no like hey what you know there was you could buy the cd and people felt like they were getting something or the record or the cassette but now um it was only in the last you know, decade that we've introduced this idea of like a subscription concept to music. And it, 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 there wasn't like tape a penny to this envelope and get 10 bits <laughs> and then, you know, make sure you remember to return the card and, or you're going to get charged for yeah. you know, the new, uh, whatever BMG right. record of the month club is or something. Yeah. Now I want to talk a little bit about downtown artists and label services specifically. Um, why would someone, work with you guys instead of using something like a distro kid, a CD baby or, or whatever, like what, what is the biggest value add that, sure. that you guys can add for an artist? I, you know, I think, I don't know. It's, it's the, I think every artist is going to have a different biggest value add out of, out of the opportunity. But I, I, ultimately it's, um, there's DIY artists, independent artists. And if you're a DIY artist, like there are, there's downtown has a great solution for that, which is CD baby. And you can put your record out and do things. There's obviously, as you mentioned, distro kit and tune core. If you're an independent artist and you want to retain ownership of your sound recordings and, and, and more importantly these days, because the majors are kind of 
adopting our model as things go on, but keep creative control over your business yeah. as well, which is make the creative decisions that you want to make around what type of music you're making, when you make it, and who you make it with. Companies like Downtown can kind of fill the gap in between the true DIYs of where you're literally doing everything yourself and, um, and, and the majors where they maybe are making some of those creative decisions for you by um, letting you focus, you the artist in this case, on, on like what music you're making and, and kind of when you want it to come out, but then work with you to create the best uh, plan to release that music, the best partners to work with to talk about and promote that music, whether they be internal staffers that we have that can help it or third party marketing agents, you know, either like internationally or domestically, um, the types of campaigns that we're going to use to to promote the the music you know, influencer type campaign, like managing the execution setup of influencer campaigns, of digital advertising campaigns, of structuring the the retail uh, rollout and interactions that I we we talked about earlier, which is like you know meeting with the Spotify's, meeting with the YouTube's in person, giving them the release the music early, and talking to them about how it's going to come out, how we're going to spend money to promote it on the different social media sites, what the types of influences that are going to be involved. Uh, how many people are likely to fans are likely to see and hear that music, you know, because uh, we, we presented it at the time. And, um, and then ultimately also fix the issues that come up, the hiccups that come up along the way. Like we've decided to change a release date or we don't want this focus single and we can help yeah. maneuver those things during the course of it and fix it when, when they need to be fixed or adjust when they need to be adjusted. Um, without you having to do it all yourself, right? So, um, and we think, and I think, and I think our history and our clients have borne out that that generally covers the cost of the distribution fee that we charge and that nets itself out as positive for the artist. And now we are lucky at Artists and Label Services and that we run a, a curated partner platform where we're not, we don't take on everybody. We decide with the artist if we think we're right for the project and we think we can be successful to their expectations and their needs. Um, but generally, you know, we think that that nets out as a positive for them versus like the cost that they would incur to de do the same thing in a DIY capacity yeah. because we built up a team of experts, a uh, history of, you know, like best practices and successes that we can call on um trusted relationships with our you know retail and marketing partners that that mean that when we talk to them about a project that they know that we'll fulfill what we say we're going to fulfill and that yeah. if we think that something's going to perform a certain way it should and that credibility adds you know value to the campaign so i think you know it it's not a, a royalty free solution like a distro kid but the value for the right level artist is is more than there uh, for the campaign. Do you guys operate on a, I'm guessing a commission model or a flat? Basically a right there. Yeah. Right sure not, yeah. Kind of like right. a, um, a wall, the orchard kind of like yeah. th that's, that's the only way that it makes sense to do it in my mind, because like you guys have a certain amount of work you're doing. So you have to be financially in incentivized to, to, to do that. Right. Cause it costs money to hire all those people to, to help and to have the relationships you have and the software infrastructure. I'm sure you guys have an awesome software suite for everyone to log in and get analytics. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, yeah. I, I haven't seen it, but I have to imagine because like I've seen the back end of what you know what I call fancy distributors. Like I, I've done a yeah. I've worked with a bunch of people who use the Orchard, um, sure. and um, it is nice. Like I don't use the Orchard for my stuff, but I, I know several people that do. And one client I work with does. It was very nice to be able to hop in a Zoom call with a representative from the orchard and have them guide us through re releasing and releasing all the singles and the record for a Christmas album. Like what, what weeks are people releasing this? And then she was able to tell us like, you probably shouldn't release this week because this other big artist is dropping on that week. And we were trying to, this artist we're working with very frequently goes number one on iTunes. And we were very <laughs> like, we don't want to compete with this super massive artist. That's going to make it impossible for us. So, those kind of scenarios are what um, 
do actually provide a really good value, you know, and I, I think, think so. it's nice to Yeah, hear. and I, I think, you know, um, right, and, and different distributors are going to have the right capacity for different artists at different times, and um, that's what we, we aim to provide, right? It's like that same sort of level of, like, expertise and knowledge and hand-holding through the whole whole process so you don't feel like it's yeah. – um, and that's, you know, it's it's geared towards that, what we call, again, career artist, somebody who's who's a professional musician and making their living through music. Um, and we have different offerings at downtown for artists at different stages in their career. Um, yeah. But it's, I think it's very, it's, it's sort of like the, like our model is really where you see almost all of the rest of the service part of the industry going, where it's, it's even the majors are now offering these like long-term license deals that look a lot like the way we do deals with artists where it's around, yeah. you know, here's a, here's a revenue share. You'll own the recordings at the end of the process, but uh, we'll keep them for probably a longer time horizon than downtown will keep them for, but uh, you know, you'll get them back eventually. And that's, I think yeah, and that's a testimony to the success that downtown has had and, and the orchards and others in terms of like changing the the, the value equation in, in the benefit of the artists and their ownership yeah. of the work that they created. And downtown isn't downtown is the top organization. Downtown isn't owned by like UMG or no. Whatever. It's downtown is the, the, the downtown the is like like you guys are a big company, but also you're not owned. You're not one of the three majors. Like for example, the orchards own yeah. Sony. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Um, so that, that's uh, a are, cool, cool aspect that you guys are independent in that way that you're not tied to, you know, whatever, because, you know, the, the, the majors have their own reputation for things they've done and you guys are truly independent and you, you started, I mean, it's not like this was a brand new thing. We were talking about this before the recording started, but you started this or you were at least one of the, I don't know if there are multiple founders, you founded Dash Go in 2004 and that's what eventually evolved into artists and label services at downtown which is that's correct yeah so i i yeah i was the founder i was uh running digital for that aforementioned management company at the time when biscuit was a client and that uh, was the dawn of the download store and they were calling us asking us as a management company for a number of the you know rights and permissions and exclusives from some of these artists and we're like well we don't control those rights we don't have the recording rights for Limp Bizkit or Backstreet Boys or Enrique Iglesias or Audio Slave. And, uh, but, but it was an opportunity to say like, Hey, if you gave us, or gave me a distribution deal, the management company decided not to get involved. Um, we would have hip pocketed artists. Like the managers are working with artists all the time that, you know, are not uh, signed yet. And we could put that music out. And uh, that, that was uh, what became originally dash go and then uh sold to uh eventually cd baby eventually acquired it and then then downtown yeah. Uh, acquired it. yeah yeah cd baby is um interesting company it's kind of amazing that after all these years they still held on to their royalty model like if they're paying per release and then the percentage cut and all that um i'm surprised they haven't caved yet honestly, <laughs> and switch to like a subscription model, like everyone else, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not as close to that business. So it's, um, I think there's a, you know, they were the original DIY distributor yeah. and I think, um, they have a very strong philosophy about the, like not having a subscription, uh, model, which, you know, I think is, something that gets evaluated over time, like, right? Yeah. Like not, you know, like it, what's right, like for consumers, what's right for the company. And um, I know yeah, some people that that's the sole reason they use them nowadays. Cause they're like, I hate subscriptions. I hate the <laughs> fact my music can get pulled if I forget to pay some bill or if I die. <laughs> um, or CD baby, it's like you pay a fee and then it's, it's done and it's there forever. And um, right, right. I've yeah. never used them, but um that's the people I know that use them. They that's like one of the big reasons they they say it. Um, I have one more question for you because we're getting sure. to near the hour. Um, what do you think about all the more more controversial stuff that Spotify has been doing 
over the last well, this year in general. So like first there was discovery mode, the, the 30 percent cut, you know, of, of things they pushed through there. And like the orchard is like blacklisted that or any everyone at Sony isn't allowed to use discovery mode. And then recently um, the news has come out in the last month or so, which the, the thousand three thousand stream threshold that's going to be happening in 2004. Um, I would imagine none of the artists you're working with have to worry about a thousand stream payment threshold, <laughs> but um, what's your guys's perspective on that? Well, on the, on the former, right. Am I addressing it right? Yeah. I'm a big discovery mode fan and I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm personally quoted on Spotify's little discovery mode part of Spotify <laughs> for artists. Um, and, uh, and I do it because I think, I think cynically, I like the, the majors who are complaining about it or some of the folks that have said about it, they're like, Oh, why are we getting, you know, discounting the music more? It's like, these are the same people that wrote giant checks to Walmart and target and Best Buy for end cap placements for CDs or discounted the CDs significantly in order to get them better retail positioning and placement. This is retail positioning and placement. You don't have to participate in it. And, uh, we at Downtown Artist Label Services very aggressively manage the songs that are in there with a very strict set of data criteria points to make sure that we aren't putting songs in that are going to cost our clients income. Yeah. And uh, that's not to say that sometimes we don't have artists that think that they're going to have some panacea from putting the song in and we might tell them otherwise and then show them a month later that maybe our data points were right and maybe they should take the song back out but yeah you know there's I, it look to me it's like that feels like a natural retail growth point and spotify is ultimately a retailer and they're going to offer programs like that and i'd be surprised if the other ones don't offer yeah you know, versions of the something like that right in a different format you might call Apple's move for Atmos, a version of that. Oh, why are they forcing everyone to make spatial mixes of everything in order to, you know, like be part of certain programs? It's, well, because they want to sell more part. AirPods. <laughs> yeah, they want, or they just they think it's better. I don't know. There's, yeah, there's a bunch yeah. of reasons. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's so like, and it's like, is Sony furious about Atmos mixes? I don't know. They don't seem to be furious about Atmos mixes. Yeah. Um, Probably cost not, them more money. Like cost them more money. And right? Atmos is, is pretty expensive usually. Especially if you've got a giant catalog like Sony yeah. does. Um, so, there, you know, on the um, on the thousand th songs streaming, streaming threshold, um, you know, it's not a monetary impact for uh, our clients mm -hmm. generally. And it's not um, and because of how low a payment threshold a thousand streams is in general, it's not a threshold that's really that meaningful for even an individual artist in terms of how much royalties a thousand streams over 12 months would actually generate for them. Yeah. So I think from that mindset, you know, there were going to be a lot of like, what was me artist stories where it's like, Oh, that's like legit great creative artist That's like impacted by this. But I think if you kind of peeled back the lid of Spotify and like looked at like what's in the jukebox down there, mostly what you're talking about at this point is a high volume of probably AI assist created songs and other things that are being pumped out. Not because there's a, like a really, really great artist behind them, but because there's somebody who thinks that having a volume of music works out there yeah. will create a revenue opportunity for them directly, not because of music, but just as a revenue opportunity. And so I, but ju just from a numbers game, I, th I suspect yeah. that's like what the majority of the target is. And there will be a number of actual real artists that, won't get paid because they didn't get a thousand songs over 12 months. But I don't think those artists would scream or did scream when they weren't paid by SoundCloud for uploading those songs and getting plays or when they uploaded right. them to YouTube and didn't qualify for the YouTube partner program, which has a similar threshold to get qualified to earn advertising shares. Yeah. So I, I think it's not, um, 
I, I don't think there's a moral problem with sort of setting a low floor like that to to, to that's generally been way. my opinion on it to I, I made a video on it like a, a well at the time we're filming this about a week ago talking about the change oh, yeah, and yeah, I'll watch and, it. Yeah. and people are like I did a poll too. About a third of people think this is great because like there's reallocating money to more serious artists and people who aren't just trying to exploit the system. But a third of people just don't care. <laughs> and about a third of people are pissed <laughs> and um, they're really bad. And like, I understand their perspective, you know, they're, that's money they would have been getting. It maybe it was only 10 bucks or 20 bucks and it does suck that they're not going to get it anymore. Like, but, but it's 20 bucks a year. And so it's it's not money that people are living off of, for example. Like, let's say someone has, they were, Wait, they get- A thousand not, streams, 20 bucks? No, a thousand streams is like $3.30. Yeah. If they have like 800 streams across 10 songs or something, um, they could be missing out on, because it's, uh, it's a per song basis. I see what you're so, saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there are some people who might be, most people are going to be missing out on like three bucks, five bucks, 10 bucks. Technically, it's possible for someone to miss out on like more, but right. I I think I mostly agree with with you. I don't like the change. I wish they just weren't doing it. But there is that pending doom of AI music constantly coming at us, right? Like people are uploading. There's probably people uploading a couple hundred songs a day, just AI albums and noise music, and I. It does make sense that that that's probably actually the much bigger target with this, not necessarily the the starting starting artists who are getting, you know, a couple thousand streams, but the, the person who's trying to upload 10,000 AI generated songs and just hoping that, well, if each one makes, makes each one 10 is, cents a month, I'm going to yeah. be a millionaire. <laughs> you know? right, exactly. Cause there's so many of them now at this point. Yeah. To your, yeah. to your 8 billion people, uh, clause. Exactly. I, I think that, I think that's really what the, the gist of it likely is, uh, for the, for, for Spotify and others. But, um, it, yeah. You know, it's, I, I get it. I get, I get the sort of like, I made this song and I put it out there and I should be compensated for it kind of perception. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's like, you know, don't put it on Spotify then. If you feel like it's not a fair place for you and you don't like their business model, you don't have to deliver it there. Yeah. Anyways, man, Ben, thank you very much for, for coming on. Is there anything you want to leave the people with? <laughs> Any advice? Yeah, or really where the time. Uh, thank you uh, for having me, and uh, I uh, I really appreciate your interest in downtown music artists and label services, and taking your time to hear my my uh, elderly man opinions on music. <laughs> <today>. <laughs>